triumph of getting this M52 engine to run in the previous episode, I'm very keen now to get this car back into a drivable condition. The first priority in doing that has to be adding a cooling system to it. I've picked up a few parts to do this, as you can see, and I'll be explaining everything as I go, which will hopefully be helpful to those of you who are doing your own M50 or M52 conversions. But first things first, let's have a quick chat so I can bring you up to speed on some of the things I've looked at off camera, and also a rundown of the parts, the goals, and some of the limitations we're facing in adding cooling system to this setup. Off camera, I've actually secured the ECU in place with a couple of rubber straps to insulate it. I'm quite happy with how that's gone. I think technically it's upside down, but I'm sure it doesn't really matter. I've even labelled it up so that I can remember in the future in what way it's modified. I've also switched the DME relay out to a genuine BMW one and got rid of that Chinese aftermarket one that was unsightly. I also have added in a bracket for the dipstick and modified the dipstick slightly for it to fit on securely to the M50 manifold. I'll overlay some clips of how that went now. It was a little bit fiddly, but I'm very happy with the result and it's, it's rock solid. And there's still plenty of little bits that need sorting out, such as this fuel breather valve. I'm actually thinking about using this properly and setting it up to work permanently, but that's for another day. Also, the wiring's still absurd and a right mess, but again, that's for another day. Today, we're talking about the cooling system. With the E30 being a 316i M40 powered car, the M40 over there originally, this is the cooling system it came with. So this is the small E30 radiator, rear shroud, front shroud to channel the air, two large hoses for either side of the thermostat on the front of the engine. The bracketry that secures it sits on these little hooks and there's this top crossbar thing which clamps it down from the top on the top of the front core support all cooled by this clutch fan which effectively screws on with a reverse thread interestingly onto the front of the water pump pulley and heat will enable this to lock up and spin this fan harder basically so it can either slip when when the engine's cold or lock up and turn with the speed of the engine when the engine's hot. It would be spinning just, just in here like this, in this shroud. So the M52 engine and its water pump does have the correct thread for this, but sadly, I don't think we can make it work. While people do report using small E30 radiators on M52 swaps and not having the engine overheat, I'm not going to take that risk, so I'm going to upgrade to this radiator. The M50 and M52 engines are known to run quite hot, and they can boil over if you're not careful. So I think it's better to be safe than sorry. What this is, is a rad from an E36, an air conditioning equipped car, so it's got a bit more volume. Effectively, everything underneath my hand here is added volume, so quite a bit more coolant. But it's also conveniently got the nice end tank, similar to the E30 one, which I think looks really tidy in the engine bay and keeps it looking fairly OE. The beauty of using this radiator is I can also use the original E30 mounting hardware for it. It will sit on these, although I think I'm gonna to have to modify this one to be a bit smaller, to be more similar to this one, but it will sit on these pucks using these rubber feet it has, and the top will fasten onto this as standard. To go with it, I have the standard E36 M52 hoses. I've got this smaller one which goes between the spider pipe and the bottom port on the reservoir. And I've got the two that go either side of the thermostat. And they're actually very different to the M40 thermostat hoses that I had that came with the car. Mostly because the M40 engine sits so much further back in the bay that it needs a quite a different routing to make it work. Now, people do say they have lots of issues trying to get these hoses to fit. so. I'm, we're going to see how we go with that. I expect I'm going to be modifying these, but to see in, in exactly what way they're modified, you'll have to keep watching. I've even got the shroud that goes with this rad, but I think I'm going to be throwing it away and not using it, because as mentioned, I need to change the fan situation and not use the clutch fan. The reason I'm planning not to use the clutch fan is for space reasons. There simply isn't going to be enough space between the M52 engine and this rad once it's all fitted in. It's very, very tight. Some people do claim they have used clutch fans, but it must be millimetres or less away from the rad. And if you have a situation where your engine shifts at all, 
you will have a very bad time because it basically turns into shrapnel and takes everything in the engine bay out. Instead of the clutch fan, I'm planning to run an electric fan, which will be thermostatically controlled by this sensor on the side here, which is another good reason to use this radiator setup. I'm planning to get a SPAL pusher fan, which fits on the front. I haven't actually got it here to show you yet, but it will be arriving a bit later in this video and I'll explain it all then. But with it being in the pusher position, I shouldn't have any space concerns on the back of the radiator. All right, without further ado, let's stop chatting and let's start fitting. That's the driver's side bottom rad mounting. The passenger side one is quite different indeed to account for the fact it's a smaller radiator that the E30 had originally. Now, one option would be to get one that matches the other side and put it in, but even then it looks like it wouldn't quite be the right width. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna modify this one and secure it onto here, and hopefully that's gonna get me a perfect fit. So let's try and do that first. Well, although what I was doing there looked a bit dodgy, it's actually worked beautifully and the rad is feeling really quite firm now, held nicely in position. So the next thing to do is to start actually looking at those hoses. We'll start with the low hanging fruit, which is this return line, which goes from the spider pipe to the bottom port on the header tank. Looks as though it might be a tad long, but it seems like it's gonna fit. So that's the top hose and the bottom hose mocked onto the thermostat and the ports on the rad. And as mentioned earlier, these are actually M52 original hoses and they seem to fit surprisingly well considering. 
Now, they both look like they're too long slightly, which isn't that surprising because the gap between the engine and the rad is, uh, is a bit closed in, more closed in than it would be on an E36. So I'm thinking if I trim both ends of each hose, I might end up with a situation where they're a perfect fit. So I'm gonna start with the top hose, I'm gonna pull it off, I'm gonna put two cuts on it, and then we'll test fit it again. Well, it looks like with a couple of centimetres chopped off either end, this top hose is a really good fit. It's BMW part number 11531720720. The bottom hose looks like it's being pushed out too far on the radiator side and causing it to rub against the block a bit too much. I think if I take a couple of centimetres off this side, I'll try it again and see if that's any better. And we might get away with not cutting this side at all, but we'll find out. Well, my plan worked with that. And whilst my cut's a bit janky at the bottom there, it's, it's definitely on firm, it's gone well. The part number for this one is 11531730928. Right, I've just chucked on the MAF and the air filter again, and I'm quite happy with how the hoses have gone on. So the only thing left to do is to chuck some water in it and just make sure they don't leak. I'm planning to stick some water in here run the engine so it's got a bit of temperature in it and then drain it back out and see what comes out as kind of a coolant flush. Let's hope nothing too nasty comes out of it. But I'm excited to run this engine for a bit longer than before, so let's get to it. Now, an M52 engine originally would have called for 10 and a half liters of coolant. So, as this is a slightly different rad and different hose lengths, I suspect it'll be a little bit different, but I'm gonna try and keep a track of what I put in so I can work out what the actual capacity is now. So let's crack on. Well, that's three litres and it's brimming. Let's open the bleeder screw so we can see if we can get some more air in before we need to start it. Well, that's about eight now and it doesn't seem to want to take any more. So I think I need to start the engine and get some warmth into it and get it all circulating so that I can put the rest in. Let's do that. Right, well that was good fun, getting the car warmed up to temp, 
I'm giving it a few revs, very excited indeed. I cannot wait to drive it at this point. The good news is, there don't seem to be any leaks on any of the hoses we've added on, so that's a great start. So the plan now is to switch the engine back on. It's had overnight to cool down because it was getting quite late on us. So we're gonna switch the engine back on just to kick any of the sediment back up. And then we'll drain it, see what comes out. What comes out will di dictate whether we're do, gonna do more flushing or whether we can go straight ahead and give it its final fill. So let's do that now. Before I go ahead and drain it, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna see if I can have a scrub around in this reservoir because it looks like somebody has put red coolant in the past. Hopefully not the wrong coolant, just the wrong color. And I'm planning to use blue, so giving it a scrub can't hurt. Less in there than I thought. The water has come out tinged pink, but actually it looks pretty clean. Most of the crap floating around in this was actually already in this dirty tub. So I'd say that that's pretty good. There's no chunks or anything. So I'm gonna go and tip this out now to work out how much coolant's actually come out and see if we can get some more out. Right, so we've spent a little while trying to get more than the four liters that we got out into that yellow box. We have raised the back end of the car and lowered the front end, but the remaining four-ish litres that's still in the system is not for budging. I suspect it's all sat in the block and won't pour out. I am aware that there is a drain plug on the side of the block which is actually tucked behind the manifolds. I'm hoping to avoid getting into battle with that really. And as I'm planning to flush through, I think if we start pouring in deionized water and do a couple of flushes, we'll end up with a system with very little traces of the original water and just coolant and deionized water effectively. So that's my plan, I'm going to avoid messing with the drain plug. And then I'll talk to you about the fan setup because that should be arriving today. <laughs> I keep mentioning deionized water. So this is what I've got here, I've actually ended up with 31 litres which is incredibly excessive for what I need now. I'd originally picked up this six, which combined with the coolant should have been enough for a fill. But as I decided I'm gonna put a bit more effort into the flush and I ended up going online and buying a big 25 litre. This is actually really good value for money. I'll link to it in the description. We've got other projects, so it's not like it's gonna to go to waste. And of course I'm flushing, so I'm not sure how much I'll end up left with anyway. And my reason for going for deionized water instead of normal water or distilled water even, is because there's much fewer impurities in this. So you can avoid things like lime scale and anything nasty building up in your cooling system and blocking it up over time. This is what you want really. Don't mess about putting normal water in or you're gonna regret it down the line. Right, so that was the third flush through with deionized water and I'm happy to say it's coming out crystal clear now so I think the job's done with that. Unfortunately, I am noticing that there's a leak, one that seems to be getting worse and worse each time the car warms up, which is the thermostat housing. I'm not sure where it's coming from exactly, but maybe I didn't tighten it up enough, maybe I need to put some more RTV as a gasket, but either way, the next step is gonna be taking the radiator off to figure out the fan situation which will be my opportunity to take a look at that. So hopefully that's gonna be fine in the end. The good news is the fan equipment that I'm planning to use has turned up. So let's head to the bench and I'll talk to you about what we're working with. So what I've got here is a 16 inch spal pusher fan which I'm going to fit on the face of the radiator using this L-shaped aluminium trim which is 25mm on both dimensions. I'm going to affix it to the radiator using rivets, using this rivet gun. 
And to make it all work, I picked up this wiring loom from BM Conversions UK. So thanks again to Dan for sorting me out with that. It picks up power from the E30's fuse box via a relay and there's a takeoff for a manual override switch, which was, which was something I was particularly keen to have. I'm planning to mount this on the knee roll so I can flick the cooling fan on and off at will if I need to override it, say I'm sat in traffic and things are looking a bit sketchy or something like that. From there, the power is fed to the spal fan through this waterproof connector and I will probably be chopping the end off this and grafting this one on. It's controlled by this thermostatic switch which is actually an 82 degrees Celsius one, and that should be a much more appropriate temperature than the, the 91 to 99 degrees that's already screwed into the radiator. So I'll be uh, switching to that to help keep temps down. The quality of this loom is just as we've come to expect from BM conversions. Really great quality, won't look out of place at all in the engine bay alongside the OE wiring. The terminals are all excellent, and I can't imagine how much effort it must have been to feed this length of wire through this much shrink wrap. Despite that, this is all looking like quite a puzzle to me right now. Wiring is not really my strong suit, so I'm gonna to have to figure it out as I go. Hopefully, once I've laid it out in the engine bay, it's gonna make a lot more sense to me and I'll be able to explain it to you a bit better. As always, I will link to everything I'm using here in the description so you can put this kit together yourself. But the first thing we need to do is whip that radiator off so I can find out how to affix my fan to it and then we can get stuck into this wiring. Right, before we lift the rad out, let's quickly have a look at this 16 inch fan and see how it fits. There is a flat at the top and the bottom, well, the, the sides I'm using as the top and the bottom, which should help us fit it within the core support. There's a little bit of room. There's actually a good amount of wiggle room there, so this fan seems to be a really great size. I think I'm gonna put a couple of marks on the rad so I know where I want it ideally, I think as centrally as possible, with clearance at the top and bottom. And then we'll work on getting it affixed at the bench. It's very heavy this, suspiciously heavy. I think I'm gonna tip this over that bucket first. No. Nope. Explains the weight. As per Dan's recommendation, I'm going to chop this aluminium bar, put two rivets in to fix it to the radiator, and use a little nut and bolt here just to hold the fan in place, obviously the same on the other side as well, and that should give it a really stable base. Having been back and forth test fitting a couple of times, I can tell you that the front core support actually encroaches on the face of the rad a little bit, which I've marked here and here. Now, judging by the width of the lip on these end tanks I should be able to cut this in a taper to keep the strength in it without it clashing against the front core support so I've marked on the depth here and then I've used a straight edge to draw a line to give me the angle to cut if I cut along here and make it symmetrical at both ends and on the other side we should have a solid support for the radiator fan
bloody perfect. I was a little bit worried about only bolting it in on opposing faces like it might seesaw, but with it being onto the flat part of the aluminium bar, it's really quite firm, really happy with that. Shouldn't rattle at all. Well, bloody excellent so far, but before I get ahead of myself, I need to look at this leak on the thermostat housing. So I need to whip the rad back out and put it to one side and look at that. And then afterwards, we'll sort out the wiring. Which part of it's leaking, I'm not 100% sure about. There was a big accumulation of drips along the bottom which were running down and then off the sump. So first things first, I'm gonna whip it off. I'm gonna check there's no cracks or anything crazy like that. And then probably put it back on with some Honda Bond just to really seal it properly. dose of sealant and now torqued back up to spec hopefully we've just solved the leak for that thermostat housing fingers crossed with that setting let's get back to the bench have another look at that radiator fan and how the loom works before we start fitting things up I'm just going to find out which one of these two wires is positive and which one's negative also gives me the opportunity to test that there's nothing wrong with this fan before we start also I'm hoping it's very quiet but we're about to find out Nice, very smooth, not too loud. So we've just confirmed the blue wire is the positive. So back to the BM conversions loom. So I need to splice on this waterproof connector on the radiator side in place of this more basic connector. So I'll do that now. I'll also add on my 82 degree thermostat in place of the other one whilst I've got it on the bench. Okay, so that's the hoses back on. Let's get this loom in situ and get all the low hanging fruit plugged in. So this end to the fuse box, this earth to here, the power down here to this plug, and this end to the thermostat switch. That leaves us with this end, which is the end I'm actually most apprehensive about because it wires into this fuse box. And so far, I've managed to steer away from this entirely. So effectively, we've got three wires that need connecting into the fuse box here. Purple, black, red. This red one connects into fuse three into the underneath of it. And this is the main thing that passes power to the fan to run it. The black one is an earth, and this connects to pin 85 on the K1 relay, also missing currently from the underneath here. The purple one connects to an ignition switch activated power, which we're gonna splice in to a, a connector that's within the fuse box. We'll join it just with crimp connections again, leaving us with these two terminals here. These two terminals are for the override switch which we're going to trail into the cabin and probably mount at the knee roll. So let's 
semi dismantle this fuse box, see if we can get these connectors put in from the underside. Fuse box is held together on three Phillips screws, one here, one here, and one conveniently hidden by these relays. So I'm gonna whip these relays out, take the screws out, and then I should be able to lift this up and we can look what's underneath it. right here. Conveniently, the two we need to be uh, turning up at the top side in standard fuse box positions have nice holes for us to push the terminals through. Starting with the red main power wire, which needs to turn up at fuse three at the top, that terminal can be pushed through here beside this purple one. Secondly, the one that needs to turn up on pin 85 on the K1 relay, there's this very handy hole here, which I'm going to push the terminal through for it to appear. Thirdly, we need to connect the purple wire to the, to the black, sorry, green and black wire, which actually currently goes into the back of this unused plug. So we'll snip it on the plug side to give us a bit of slack and splice that on with the crimped connectors to the purple wire. I've got to restrain myself right now from jamming these into these holes that I can see because they are barbed. They're actually quite fancy terminals, not just the, the cheap ones you see. So once I've put them in, they're going to be locked in place and they're not going to come back out without destruction. So what I need to do is make my life a lot harder by feeding it in to the fuse box through the rubber grommet. And there seems to be a nipple there that's unused, which I'm going to cut to use as my access. Then we'll get them connected. Start by cutting this green and black wire ready. There's some securing tab stopping that, so I'm going to try and unclip that now. So far so good, I've got my three connections into the fuse box, which I'm really happy with. It leaves me with these two connectors, black and purple. These are what connect to this end here. There is a, a white cover which these ends will slot into to make it a nice connection. And this is the manual override switch. As this is going to need to run across the engine bay into the cab, ideally mounted where the knee roll is, I'm going to look for a way to fit this wire in to the fuse box on the other side. And once this is connected up, it'll all be tucked into here and fastened down and you'll never see it.
Right, with that fastened back together, we need to put in to fuse slot three, which was previously vacant, a 20 amp fuse. And that's the red wire we put in from the bottom, the main power to the fan. And I can stick my relays back in. Right, as I mentioned earlier, I don't have a relay in position K1. It's actually the low speed auxiliary fan, which would have been present in E30s that have air conditioning equipped, which this Poverty Spec 316i didn't. So to fill the space, I'm gonna use the relay that came out of here. And the reason I'm gonna do that is because there's an annoying ledge inside the fuse box that's preventing me putting this new relay in because it's got the locating lugs so that it could fit into a connector like this. These two relays, although one's Bosch and the other one's SWF, they are effectively exactly the same thing. They're just in a very slightly different form factor. So I'm gonna put my new one in here, which would have been the horn relay because there's nothing in the way of those lugs and the horn relay in K1 which is now for the fan. Before we start putting water in it, the big question really is, does it work? We'll get a good idea about that if we turn the ignition on and test this override switch. of time to cool down now and it was a bit of a triumph actually as you'll have seen the fan clicks on and off at the right temperature which is phenomenal it all works perfectly the override works really well the we're getting hot air out of the vents on the dash so which tells us that the bleeding up job we did has been relatively successful although we won't know for sure until the car drives down the road and the coolant sloshes around a bit which at which point we'll give it a bit more of a bleed but all the signs are looking excellent so now we need to give it its final fill of coolant. So that's the next thing to do. This is the antifreeze coolant I'm planning to put in it. I know the purists among you will be shrieking out about the fact I haven't purchased BMW's own blue coolant, but this is good and cheap. I've had good experiences with it and it is the right spec for this M52 engine. It being blue is one thing because that's the same color as BMW's, but the color is actually somewhat irrelevant. It's the formulation you need to look out for when you're picking coolant for your engine. This one is a BS6580 standard and it's suitable for aluminium engines being ethylene glycol based. So bear in mind the M52 is all aluminium, the block and the head is aluminium. So I'm happy to use this. This should be the right stuff for this motor. There's three liters left in this. And as the cooling system has been taken around nine, it should give us our perfect 33% dilution, which should be good for up to 20 minus 20 degrees Celsius. Never gets that low around here. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna drop three liters of the deionized water and put this in. And then when we run it all around the system, it will mix itself.
Brilliant, so success again. We raised the front of the car to make sure the bleeder was the highest point and got it right up to temperature. Fans kicked on and off a few times and all the air seems to have come out of it. As mentioned earlier, we won't really know until we drive it, but I think we've given it a damn good start and it may even be completely bled up, which would be perfect. And that thermostat housing no longer leaks, so I'm gonna chalk that one up as a win too. Shout out again to Dan at BM Conversions. Really happy with that loom, it's brilliant. Still need to connect the override switch to the knee roll and feed it in, but that's something I'm gonna worry about another day because my knee roll is actually in a bad state. You'll probably see that on an upcoming video. I'm gonna find some way to repair it. As always, I'll link everything I've used in the description, so feel free to click through and check those out and see if you wanna pick one of those looms up for yourself. Now, before you rush to comment about this bleed screw, yes, it's atrocious. It's, it started off bad and I've only made it worse. I'm gonna get another one purchased because that's gonna cause me a problem in the future, so I can't live with that. As for what comes next, why don't you subscribe to find out. I'm very close to driving this car for the first time since the swap, which is incredibly exciting. Thank you very much for watching.